please welcome John Wiggins. Over to you, John, for, as mentioned, our final presentation of the day. Okay, thanks firstly to everybody for having the power of uh, concentration for all those hours that we've been sitting here and listening to a really intriguing, intriguing uh, discussions, questions from the from the attendees and uh, definitely the from the speakers. Uh, really, really interesting. Uh, the way that we see that technology is going forwards and it's advancing always very fast. And interesting to hear from Phil also that. Uh, he, he seems to think that, and definitely there is a there's a plateau, there is a, a level, a sort of a steady state at the moment of what aer aerodynamics are and where they can be and towards manufacturing. Um, what I want to introduce you today, and um, some of you will be aware of how I work and, and the work that I've done, and not only just in cycling, but in motorsport, in MotoGP and, and Formula One. Um, and I come out of a with a background of uh, swimming biomechanics and fluid dynamics. Uh, I've worked with British Swimming and with Speedo um, and several, several other companies in uh, product development design and trying to basically bring a closer transition between bridging the gap between science and technology and um, to actually how the athletes feel that technology in the real world. So I'll move quickly onto my next slide. Um, yeah, so basically how we see it as a coach and how definitely how we try to portray that and bring that across to the rider is that our energy and efficiency of how we how we bring that energy over is very crucial in understanding today what we're going to be talking about is about shaping and body shape and how important that is and how dexterity how we try to bring more dexterity and development of products and how we bring that into having the riders understand and that's always quite the big tra um, transition, quite big, the big void at the moment, if you look at it like that. And uh, definitely the where uh, Chris has touched, uh, and definitely with Kelly, uh, where we're trying to make a smooth transition from the technology, the, the high-tech uh, opportunities that we work in the world of today with aerodynamics um, and fluid, and the background of fluid dynamics, we try to bring that into the real world. So. Um, shape, form, and power are crucial elements uh, that any coach, any uh, sports scientist, um, and any top athlete would have experienced. And trying to manipulate and trying to mold your body into certain certain shapes and form to make yourself more accessible, more um, to the different in environments, to the different changes, to the different air densities, to the different level that you wish to to, to perform at. So. Um, we see that uh, very clearly in that molding your body to manage the performance. So understanding stability, trying to become more stable, having a better core stability. Um, actually, and very intriguing uh, that Phil mentioned about fixing fixing the angle of the hip um, and how they design the bike, um, especially for triathletes and more so now for more and more uh, um, evidence and research fact based and science to prove that a more forward position is more beneficial definitely towards triathletes where they're trying to get maximum performance out of their quadriceps and trying to um, maximize their energy efficiency and saving energy for the run by not using the hamstrings. Um, and that can be anything from crank lengths, crank, crank sizes to different pedal setups, to different shoe cleat setups, um, balancing your body, having an understanding and I think that the three topics here that we talk about from stability, comfort, and sustainability at the end of the day, when we come out of wind tunnel technology, is actually under, trying to understand um, the position that you're in at that moment, how sustainable is that? Um, and that is that is key and clue. And we heard that a little bit with Bert, uh, all the transitions. He was actually in the era of yeah, understanding, making a transition from heart rate to power. There were a lot of developments in in uh, in the end of the 90s, beginning of 2000, and uh, all these adaptations to training. We started to, to uh, create a lot of data, and uh, data logging is something that is very crucial, very important to me. has always has always been uh, the way that I uh, one of the first working with power meter. Um, and how we try to bring that across, have an understanding. And I worked in saddle um, development, um, a project from an Italian company, where we try to improve the stability. So we actually try to complement the way that the manufacturers were de designing frames 
and we were trying to create a better stable position that the riders were able to sustain that longer um, and being able to a good example of that was um, with uh, Fabio Cancellara. Can Cancellara was uh, one of the first to use a new type of technology and it sort of panicked some of the other manufacturers into um, especially some companies I don't want to mention any names any brand names but there were certain companies using sandpaper to be able to create the same amount of stability in that positioning. So comfort was then also clue. So sandpaper is not exactly very comfortable. At the end of the day, there were a lot of ripped shorts and uh, a lot of riders expressing a lot of un uncomfortable uh, experiences. And um, there was a very good uh, research study done by British Cycling about that with, uh, with uh, soft tissue injuries, especially towards women cyclists. And there was a lot of advances, advancement in, uh, in technology, saddle technology. So these three areas are really clue to us. And I think that when, when we make that transition and we are making it very rapidly and we're making it very smoothly with the Pro Tour teams, these are the areas that we want to bring into the dynamics. The dynamics of a rider being a rider with his sensation, the dexterity from the rider being able to complement it and say, okay, look, this is, uh, I'm more stable in this position. I have more power. I'm more fixed in that position. I can bring my power across more effectively and efficiently. And that was, that's, and I'm more comfortable in that position as well. So balance and comfort are totally hundred percent crucial in understanding. And that, that brings us onto the sustainability and comfort balance, understanding gravitational forces, understanding the cent center mass, um, body mass, um, and being able to create that and manage that over a, a length of time, whether it's, and let us say, um, that is very clear to see if it's a four kilometer individual pursuit or a four kilometer team pursuit, whether they're getting up to 70 kilometers an hour now, it's uh, incredible speeds at the team pursuit and from a standing start, it's not very comfortable. Um, we try to optimize that comfort, but at the end of the day, if we look at a longer distance um, and we look towards the hour record, uh, it's also not very comfortable in the last 20 minutes, but we've tried to be as effective and efficient and, and, and optimize comfort into the first 30, 40 minutes of a ride. Um, and that's very true for triathletes, um, definitely in the Ironman. Um, so they're out on the, the 180 kilometer course and they need to be as efficient and energy saving as possible to be able to handle and tackle the marathon at the end. Um, so these are effective areas that we can see and we can bring in the dynamics uh, with, an, with an aero lab that we can confirm. And I think that was some of the questions to answer that. It's confirming the, the, the feeling, the data, that the data logging that we create and the different opportunities from a wind tunnel and actually bringing that dynamics into the real world um, and being able to confirm uh, what the riders are actually feeling. Um, that is, that's bringing the effectiveness into that. And of course, the more accuracy that we get now with torque analysis, um, power data, if you want to look at it that way, and the more effective that we are to be able to, and that's uh, crucial to, to aerodynamics, especially with an aerolab that we have that power data. Um, so we see ourselves as actually a home um, where we're going to accommodate power meter technology. Um, we see it as a data logger. Um, we're going to be able to accommodate many, many more um, ANT plus or Bluetooth technologies. Um, so we'll be able to understand about uh, cooling and body temperature, um, skin temperature during long efforts, um, and metabolic rates, VO2 maxes. Uh, there's a very good system on the market at the moment. It's becoming more and more accurate where we can actually analyze VO2 max in the field. Um, so all these type of components are very um, complementary. And we try to um, to utilize that and channel it into being very effective towards the, towards the teams and athletes. Um, the end of the day, uh, if we look at saddle technology, and you can see clearly that there's always a lot of difference. Everybody's individual. Um, there are companies that are going more to the 3D um, technology, where the, the saddle is actually going to mold to your, to your specific body. This is very important because any travel losses and what i mean by that is vibration we see a vibration and a lot of uh, loss by a lot of shifting a lot of movement on the saddle um, this is a lot of energy cost um, and an energy loss basically so we try to channel that and have a good understanding um, a perfect saddle fit what is a perfect saddle fit is something and that, that goes to, together with saddle height, uh, cleat positioning, um, crank length, positioning forwards and backwards from the uh, on, on the bottom bracket, 
Um, so every event, whether it's um, mountain biking, cross country, or is it a, a, a team pursuit, has a crucial aspect of where you are positioned on the saddle um, to the ratio of gear ratio. So gears and cadence um, play a massive role. The bigger gear that you have, obviously you want to be uh, um, try to achieve the, a larger gear um, and uh, to be able to go faster, further. Um, and uh, th those opportunities are coming more and more about with the different technology changes in aerodynamics now. So that's, uh, that's a crucial part. Um, so you can see that we did, uh, uh, and I worked a lot on this, um, this is actually technology that comes out of the Formula One that, we've, that I've used and uh, developed with MotoGP. Um, and that is a, a, a technology that we try to create. We try to have an understanding of better grip, a better positioning, better vibration, understanding about cooling. Um, and uh, it's, it's very crucial also with soft tissue injuries or creating a better blood circulation, blood flow. And um, so all these areas that we see are very beneficial and crucial towards an aerodynamic position because that holds you in a certain position that creates your comfort, creates the opportunity to be effective um and uh, be able to uh, be very specific in uh, in how you work um how slippery um and this is an intriguing aspect how slippery do we want to get and i want to try and create a, uh, a picture of this in the way that um a buoyancy in uh, fluid dynamics in swimming is super, super important. And some, a lot of good top swimmers have an incredible amount of natural buoyancy in them. Um, the technologies that were came forward, I had a lot to do with, with swimming technology, was basically creating oxidation uh, underneath the swimmer from the, from, the, from the speed suits. And that created a bit more lift. Um, when we created lift, it doesn't mean that we go forwards, but propulsion from the, let's just, let us say the levers, um, how they use their hands and their feet were very crucial in that. But to create the, the body mass and how it's positioned in the, in the water is very similar to, to how we see body mass and positioning and gravitational forces in cycling. And uh, swimming is, more, is slightly more complex in the way that you are free. Um, so core stability, being able to be very buoyant, high in the water, being able to, and we tried to create a better, larger surface area. Um, so there was more still water, uh, cat, a court, still water catch, um, and, a, and a greater amount of water and propulsion uh, at the end of the stroke. Uh, in cycling, it's a, it's a little similar. Maybe for a lot of you, it's um, a little bit out of, out of the box thinking. Um, but in, in certain ways, we try to have an understanding of the different flows and the different air, uh, your angles and the different aspects of different positioning and different clothing um, opportunities and how smooth that we want to create that athlete. So if I see a swimmer, how flexible and how smooth he swims through the water um, bilaterally uh, or uh, symmetry is very crucial in swimming. And uh, I think that we're not there yet in cycling to have a full understanding of that. Um, and everybody is in some ways asymmetric, um, but st stability uh, and symmetry are crucial in, uh, in any part of uh, cycling biomechanics. Um, and we try to, and being more symmetric, um, have an understanding of uh, leg length discrepancies, having an understanding of how you position yourself on the saddle and what works. And Chris Froome is a very good example of that. Chris Froome is not very symmetric, but he's very effective how he brings the power to the pedals. Um, so those are areas that are, that are intriguing in aerodynamics um, because um, to be effective and try to stay still and sustain that stillness and be uh, slippery by using different uh, helmets, different technology that apply to you as an individual are crucial in being sustainable. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, different helmet choices, um, being able to, it's not, and it's uh, quite often quite a a funny or uh, appealing uh, to very many scientists when they listen to cyclists. Um, cycling technology has for many years been driven by the bling aspect, especially towards helmets. We see time and time again in, in wind tunnel simulations. Uh, that even though the helmet with a visor looks fantastic, sometimes it's not for that specific athlete the fastest technology to, to wear. Uh, it's sometimes faster without or just with sunglasses or, or without sunglasses. Um, 
very much dependent on whether you have a long peak helmet at the back or a short bullet helmet, uh, depending really on how sustainable you are to stay in that position. So if you're moving around a lot, um, then a, a smaller helmet is more uh, definitely more effective um, for you. A different speed suits, different air densities. Um, very good story the other day with Jim Miller, how <clears throat> they worked uh, with the Olympic federations and the speed uh, downhill skiers had three different suits for three different um, air densities. So the humidity, um, different aspects of the of skiing. So uh, very very complementary through all the different sports to have a good understanding. Or I have always been a very uh, big advocate of uh, of learning from other each other and becoming stronger together in different sports to optimize and be able to use different uh, opportunities, different techniques from different sports and apply that to to the specific sport that you work in. Um, yeah, and different uh, shoe types. Um, there are some nice studies out there where we can see uh, different heel kick. Uh, a flatter shoe or a heel kick makes a, a massive difference uh, in your saddle height or saddle setback in bike fitting. Um, so definitely there are many, many areas that we're, we're just trying to, to make it acceptable to everybody um, in the real world, in the dynamics that we have a good understanding of, uh, of uh, yeah, that it's a complex, it's a complex situation. It's not about being static uh, at the end of the day. It's about being effective and bringing those dynamics um, into the real world and being effective with that, with the decision making and the research behind that. Um, so these are, uh, this is a slide that I've used um, quite, quite a lot often in positioning and biomechanics. Um, and I touched a little bit about uh, how important it is if I see in Australian, for example, in uh, Australian Cycling Federation, we had some issues uh, last year with some uh, fi fixed cleat issues with uh, with some of the girl cyclists, uh, they were they were changing from fixed uh, on the track to to more a lot of movement on the road, which had some issues with uh, with uh, the, the knees, um, and uh, that, that was qu quite an easy solution. But what for us, what was the most important aspect is that uh, it just showed the for for the athletes coming out of a a very specific position, fixed position, um, and maybe not so comfortable uh, in a four kilometer pursuit um, and actually bring it into the real world of uh, dynamics of everyday training um, and changing cleats and changing positions. It's, uh, it's sometimes, it's not, it's not beneficial uh, to make radical changes. So even though we see a lot of riders, they come out of extreme positions and I've worked with many of them uh, from the track to the road. Uh, we have to compromise somewhere. Uh, we have to be uh, very understanding and very, try to try to optimize in the equipment, even though with, with certain sponsors, it's quite restricts them uh, in the choices that they can make. Um, but what, what I try to bring across here is uh, an understanding that, uh, yes, we want to go f uh, faster, more economically, um, and being able to achieve the, the, the same distances, but uh, quicker at the end of the day. Um, efficiency and being able to be uh, an automatic, trying to have an autonomous system where your stress levels, your, um, your your understanding of your body and being able to be in a comfort zone uh, is, is crucial. Um, so when we see uh, top professional riders going out for six hours at altitude on time trial bikes, uh, which is not uncommon with pro tour riders, it sounds very extreme, but it's done quite regularly, especially in this time of month, uh, year. Um, when in South Africa, altitude, not high altitude, but uh, just getting used to being in a time trial position uh, for a long time, uh, maybe changed components because of sponsor commitments and, and these type of areas. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, fine tuning the perfor performance potential through all. that uh, the technology, what uh, Aerolab are bringing forward now is crucial to this. Uh, it's going to make everybody feel very individual, have direct live feedback with each other, uh, being able to work one-to-one -one with the coaches, um, being able to see te technological differences that may, maybe would work for you but not for your teammate, whereas in the past everybody's come out of the wind tunnel with very similar setups um, and it's just not sustainable for everybody. So that's... Uh, and you can see that in the evolution and uh, the morphology, and it was a little bit touched today as well. And uh, and it's quite intriguing to see some of these old uh, 
um, if you see Beryl Burton and the, and, and, and the type of technology changes and the, the typical um, uh, British mentality around time trialing and how effective that they tried to, and all the developments that were in time trialing in those days. Um, and basically, yeah, that we, we've spoken about it from the very beginning today about the Greg LeMond story with Lauren Finion. Uh, and then obviously the Superman position with uh, Boardman and, uh, and Aubry, what they tried to create, which was uh, alternative, uh, innovative, um, and then the realistic um, approach. And it was good to see Bert Rusum's bet was a big challenge because Bert was is tall um, and uh, he's nearly two meters. Um, and um, that is a big challenge in bike, not only just in bike fitting, but in aerodynamics as well, because a lot of these cyclists, um, not like swimmers, uh, oft, quite often not very flexible. Um, and uh, you, you, it's very difficult. It's a big challenge to try to mold them into different positions and more effective and economical uh, positioning. Um, so that is, we see that here very clearly. Um, the challenges that we ha they had uh, within the testing, and this is uh, old test school basically from uh, Peter Keane days back in uh, Great Britain, uh, understanding what frontal area was, how the importance of frontal area, um, what we're trying to achieve with a big gear uh, in those days, what now we call a big gear. In those days, it was quite a small gear. Um, but uh, having an understanding how important it was to have a good uh, and, uh, and a helmet that fitted correct for you, um, that, that uh, made the correct uh, transition between the, uh, the, the gap on the back of your head and being able to line up with your back. Um, that was, for Chris Boardman, uh, a very big uh, part of his story, um, together with the frame manufacturing, obviously. Um, but uh, frontal area was key. Uh, for, for us, uh, in understanding uh, in biomechanics is obviously body mass um, positioning gravitational forces and uh, what we see now is a trend uh, of uh, more comfort at the front more balanced at the front so there's lesser weighted uh, body positioning at the front so there's much more comfort being able to what we call is be in, uh, being able to crawl behind uh, maybe your hands uh, getting getting not so deep anymore in the frontal area but being able to mold your body differently behind your hands um, that's uh, that, that, that's a key area and being able to complement that with technology as well on top of that. Um, so what we uh, or what I looked at and uh, this is a this is a part of my research, part of my book uh, that was published in 2010. Uh, we looked at trying to achieve the big engine. Obviously, we're trying to work with Olympic champions, world champions, world record holders, and uh, there were some certain key areas. Of, okay, the big engine. Uh, the big foundation and trying to stabilize that and try to have an understanding of stability, not only just in the physiology, but also in the bike mechanics, of course. Um, and that was, uh, that was in a, a very important part that we came very qu quickly to understand in the physiology at the end of the day, the anaerobic part, uh, the part that everybody's interested in at the end of the day is actually trying to make you make yourself faster um, uh, with, with expending expenditure of the same amount of energy, um, and being able to be sustainable in that, uh, being able to be, uh, uh, trying to realize, trying to understand, um, and repeatable in that aspect of, uh, phys not only just in physiology, but in positioning. So there were some big steps made, um, in the running up to the Olympics 2012 with saddle choices, um, types of frame, types of manufacturer, how the manufacturers work, types of helmets, types of speed suits, how people um, tried. That was very interesting with Phil, what he spoke about earlier, is that, uh, yeah, in uh, the rules, the rule book is, is uh, obviously a rule book is, uh, is very important to, to, give the, to give the direction, give the, uh, is everybody is regulated, and there is a good understanding of that. And I think that in 2012, there were some very big steps made um, that were similar lines to how Speedo uh, saw the new swimming world records with the new swimsuits. Um, but there were certain suits uh, that definitely in 2012 that had a different breathability uh, that nobody had ever seen before, and also different uh, trips, uh, wind trips, on, on the suits as well, which were uh, more aerodynamic and more efficient in aerodynamics. Um, so that was, uh, th those were, those develops, developments have gone further now, definitely with the technology. Um, and it's gone a lot about energy uh, consumption as well. Um, understanding the, the met metabolics and understanding skin temperature 
Um, so there are there are a lot of there's a lot of good research out there at the moment um, with that. Uh, so uh, these are areas that we see um, finding a home for many of these um, uh, portable um, sensors, and that's uh, calibrating it with power meters. Um, being an outdoor VO2 max metabolic rates, body temperatures, um, fabrics, and trying to integrate that into uh, into a data logger that we see as a part of Aerolab, their story. Um, so efficiency and riding faster with less energy, um, that is definitely uh, what everybody wants to try to achieve. Um, there's some old old data uh, slides here, and interestingly, from what Savello, uh, Soloist, at 45k an hour, and the different opportunities, and now we have Bet touched on it, uh, asked them the question about where they are now at wider rims and uh, with uh, a rolling resistance and wider tires, and it was very clear once we started to achieve the first data uh, analysis um, that there was a big, big difference in different equipment different equipment choices but then also obviously with the uh, body positioning has the greatest effects in uh, in aerodynamics uh, in frontal area um, and that uh, so that, that and i touched it a little bit earlier um with uh, triathletes as well how the positioning uh, more forward positioning and uh, there are some nice studies as well about climbing um i know that the sky um, team uh, what is now Ineos uh, and Grenadiers, Ineos Grenadiers, uh, they they did some smart studies about climbing uh, simulations and about being having a more forward position on the climb, um, on, on saddle saddle positioning. Um, so that was uh, definitely definitely areas of uh, where we where we would where I would see very effectively in uh, neuromuscular um, aspects uh, where we want to try to uh, optimize on positioning and uh, having an effective um, or power or torque output as we would see them. So there was a study that, uh, that I did with colleagues, uh, what I worked, um, after the Rio Olympics, I worked with, uh, BioRacer, uh, for some time in, uh, aerodynamics. And we had a good understanding of what frontal area was all about, uh, even back in the days. And that's actually a good picture, uh, bottom left, that's Bert Rusum's when I did some testing with him, with, uh, Uli Schobera with, uh, SRM. Uh, one of the first riders to actually do that and have an understanding of uh, a, a, type, a new type of helmet uh, that was better fitting for Beth, have a better understanding of uh, how we can try to mold his body better. Um, and, uh, and, and again, a very good story about how we uh, try to optimize from his, uh, his equipment um, to, uh, and, and the body to make that equipment faster. So it's not the other way around, as many people think. And I touched on a little bit earlier. Um, so that was very clear with the data that we achieved and um, some of these graphs and you can look at them afterwards or in your own time, everybody will have a link for these presentations. Um, and that, that, that was, it was key for us that we had a good understanding of what frontal area was all about and how we can try to mold the body to be more sustainable in that position. And it's very clear to see uh, the improvements, the gains um, are the largest gains that we can achieve in uh, body um, uh, molding um, f forming your body into a better, more effective position, efficient. And that is, uh, yeah, if we see, and that is what marginal gains is all about. And that's what the story is all about. Okay. Aero socks, what are the gains there? What are all the small advantages? Um, and, uh, try to complement that together with the main, uh, advantage of molding your body into an optimal position that works for you, uh, that works for the equipment that you have. Um, yeah, and uh, this was a good uh, example of how we worked at the Federation with uh, um, a certain uh, company that they introduced the vibration technique to try to keep our riders as still as possible on the track. Um, that was uh, that was key running up to Rio Olympics in 2016, uh, and the riders had a good good uh, feedback every time they moved. They had a very annoying vibration feeling in the back of their helmet. Uh, and that kept them focused and kept them uh, bas basically regimented, a uh, bit, bit uniformed into the understanding of what training and aerodynamics is all about. And it's about optimizing, but being aut an automatic pilot, not thinking about it, but being able to sustain and be in the same position for as, as long as needed. And uh, the world records are being being broken continuously and, uh, and Australia put down a massive gauntlet, I think, for uh, 
uh, Great Britain and, and other countries to try to follow and try to be as competitive. We see now the gearing that the, the teams are using, and it just comes down really to the to better manufacturing, stiffer uh, frames, better understanding of physiology, um, understanding. And um, Australia are very, very good at this um, in their talent identification program, especially uh, originally with swimmers. I think many of the other sports have taken on the talent ID program that swimming had. Um, but the morphology uh, in swimming, for example, if you didn't have a size 51 shoe, uh, in your talent ID program, uh, or you were not uh, for a 50 meter swimmer, you were not uh, close to a meter 90. Uh, you, you didn't qualify, you didn't qualify, even if you were a brilliant swimmer or you had to go more towards 1500 meters, um, to specify if you, if you fancied being and were fast in 50 meters, you wouldn't qualify in their talent program. And that's very much what they did with the, uh, with the team pursuit as well. They really basically had four guys that were, or eight guys in those days with the two teams, uh, they were very similar, very similar in physiology, very similar in height and build, and um, they could mold and they would look as one on the on the on the track, um, and they were just a very very uh, well oiled um, group of guys, and and I think that uh, the the federations and the Institute of Sports um, do very well in in those type of programs. Um, and then it's uh, well, it's not an easy job, but it uh, makes the job a lot easier. Uh, for the coach at the end of the day for race tactics and being able to understand who is actually on song and who can ride a one and a half laps and who can be longer on the front, who should be longer on the front, but can't and being able to work that in as a team. Um, and in aerodynamics, that's, uh, that's crucial um, is trying to be effective as, as four riders and try to get as four to the very end. Um, and uh, yeah, that is uh, obviously performance where as um, unbelievably gone uh, you know at a fast pace forwards uh, if we t if we see the type of uh, aero socks and the type of um, clothing and how fast that is uh, in wind tunnel testing and uh, what we can actually bring to that and that's intriguing with aero lab is um, and after doing many hours of wind tunnel testing and seeing the guys how disappointed that they were actually by just changing a few little things or maybe their suits were not as fast as they thought, or their bikes were not as fast as they thought. Um, actually bringing that over into a, into a field test environment and being able to comp tell them and being able to show them the benefits of the equipment that they have in the real world. I think that is, that's a very, very important part of uh, what Aerolab will have to, to play today in, in, in this, uh, in the next, uh, next few years. Um, there's, there was very, very clear to see that and this is a very good example of aggressive positions, very aggressive, but very effective uh, for the type of performance that they want to produce. So even though we would see uh, that it's less comfortable um, uh, and there are very, very small um, adaptations that can be made from this, um, but trying to make that as effective as possible. That was very, very clear and very key um, to the expertise in that type of field in that type of environment. Whereas we take a uh, look at a road cyclist and it was crucial, not only just the, the type of uh, breathability, the comfort, um, but also bringing that aerodynamics. So again, we went into, into a very, very, very specific area of dexterity and uh, good feedback from the, from the rider. Um, that he that he is positioned. You see that here also in this type of frame. That's what Phil was talking about. How much steeper uh, the geometry of the framework has become, and how much more stable that that is in the field of work, and how much more we have to try to make that rider as comfortable as possible. And there are certain uh, brands, um, uh, performance wear brands, that are very good at that, um, having good understanding and molding molding basically that uh, rider into an optimal position. So um, I'm going to go swiftly through on to that, uh, the last thing I want to introduce you to uh, how we run, how we see and running through um, a test protocol, um, the type of equipment testing that we can do and how accurate that the AeroLab is um, and what we can actually do with that in the real world dynamics. 
and we can have a good understanding here between the three shots that we have the the baseline that's always in very important in any type of test environment that we make we try to realize and try to have a good understanding of the baseline um, so for this um, specific rider uh, we just we had a baseline of uh, of clothing and uh, with that, that was uh, cru crucial that we ha actually uh, were running through the test protocol that we went through um, to an in improving and seeing a skin suit improvement. And then at the ultimate day is, uh, and repeating that test at the end as well, um, is that we can see a skin suit with an aero helmet with a visor for this rider was more beneficial at that moment. So um, what... What I want to try to introduce and try to create a picture for everybody is that we have an iOS platform. We run mostly our tests on an iPad, although we can do it on an iPhone. Um, if you're testing by yourself or just one-to-one uh, -one with your coach. Um, and uh, the opportunity here is to actually understand that um, how we build a test, how we build a test protocol, the input that we put in and we add a configuration to the test. Um, we communicate then uh, with the with the error lab. Uh, we communicate with an IQ app on the um, Garmin, and we communicate then with the iPad. So it's important in all test protocols, and I think quite a, everybody touched that on that today. Um, is actually important, and you can see here to try to put in as much data as possible, uh, as much accurate power meter um, data um, instruments. If we can look at it as an instrument uh, of power data, that's very important. A power meter location, whether it's on a crank, whether it's a spider. Um, and uh, then with the test format, what type of test format do you want to do? Is it out and back? Is it, uh, is it a free ride test, which is really, really important uh, for reconnaissance, um, course reconnaissance. If you're doing Hawaii, you want to know uh, what your type of equipment, how it reacts to wind speed and wind gusts, so your angles. Um, if you want to have a good understanding at that part of the course, what sort of power uh, output should I be at that type of speed on my race pace? Um, this is this is the type of test uh, uh, feedback protocol that we can go through that gives immediate feedback to the coach and to the athletes. So it's very very crucial. We saw a very good example in the in the Tour de France um, when they changed from a time trial bike to a client or to a road bike um, on the climb. And Aerolab can we would be able to show that with uh, different tire pressures and the different equipment choices and the exact moment when you should be changing, uh, when it's not beneficial anymore for you to be aerodynamic position on a time trial bike and when you can change. Um, so that's uh, ob obviously then we, um, we go through again through the bicycle type, if it's a UCI bike or a time trial bike or, or a mountain bike or a road bike. And what is actually being tested? Um, are we testing equipment? What type of equipment? Are we testing both equipment and positioning or just positioning? Um, so that's uh, also uh, very important. Um, now you can see also the, as we add to the configuration, what I just touched on is uh, where is your power meter positioned? Um, whether it's in the pedals or, or crank or spider, what type of power meter and that your choice of power meter is that you're using. Um, so everything is accommodated within the Aerolab. It makes it very easy. It's a very easy step-by-step -step run through. Um, it's uh, it's very user-friendly. Um, the, the coaches, uh, and I know that's always the biggest challenge, even from the days when stopwatches and try to accumulate more data and try to bring that across on a on a USB platform to to. Uh, record more data basically over your swimmers or whether you're or runners or uh, cyclists on the track. Um, so this this technology really has um, has brought uh, everything much fast forward. And there you can see we can do indoor free ride, which is basically as everybody would know would be velodrome uh, testing. Um, and then you can make a choice out of the type of bike that you're, the type of equipment, uh, whether you're uh, track or UCI time trial. And th from that configuration. Uh, then you can actually, and that's very important in your testing. So you have to mark down, yeah, what are you testing it? Like I just mentioned with position or type of equipment uh, or other uh, aspects that you want to test um, in the aerodynamics. And uh, then you go through and you, you update uh, with your configuration, the, the, the name of the session, if you call it session one, or you call it uh, the free ride, the course reconna reconnaissance. Um, so you just have to label everything and you, you put your input um, and then you're pretty much uh, nearly ready to go. 
Um, you can see your configurations back. You have a fill, full um, history of uh, what you're recording or what you're about to record. Um, and then it's actually uh, connecting with the AeroLab and running through and having a connection uh, with, uh, with the AeroPro and uh, with your power meter and wheel speed, speed data is crucial in, uh, in, uh, in accumulating the correct and uh, accurate, um, even though we do measure all the time with, uh, with uh, industry-led GPS, um, but it's, uh, we, we always have a, a wheel speed um, unit on the, on the wheel. Um, then we go through basically, and it's uh, with, uh, with with high accuracy GPS. Then um, that we can pick up your location where you're going to start, and you can start your test. And then we basically run through, and we are ready to go. Uh, um, so this would uh, be then a um, an out and back test that we were, that we did. Um, and uh, here you can see your dashboard in front of you on uh, the iPad, and. Um, we can see that in session one with our rider uh, that we had, and we went through with four out and backs. So that was uh, really important to create our baseline and we had a good understanding. So what we quite often see is with our first run, um, sometimes the, the riders, they move around, or they're not, not uh, positioned correctly and um, they don't feel hundred percent. So the second and third, and you will see the more accurate. And then the fourth uh, run that we do the session. So you can see here very clearly how accurate the error lab is working. Um, and we can get uh, the variance as well. The variance uh, quantifies basically what, uh, how the error of margin that we've uh, from any body shape or body movement, or for example, if there was a car passing uh, during the test, we would see any uh, uh, changes in that. Session two uh, with the with the speed suits and uh, keeping the set, the helmet the same, so we go gradual and in gradation through our task uh, protocol. Uh, and there you can see we did three out and backs. And then we go through to session three, which we repeat. So our, our last session, we always repeat, uh, which is very important for accumulating our uh, data and trying to be as accurate as possible at the end of the day. Um, so they, there you can see very clearly with the speed suit and then the speed helmet or uh, yeah, an aero helmet uh, with, with visor. Um, and there you can see where we can have a, a clear drop in uh, in in CDA, and that was very in, important to us to have an understanding. We're not talking about molding the body. I mean, obviously, we can see in this in this shot that we can do a lot with the shoulders with this rider, um, but we're actually and we're not dropping the head between the shoulders or anything. So we're keeping the same as the baseline. Just having a pure understanding of okay, we're changing fabrics and we're changing a helmet. That's all. So the next steps would be for us with this type of rider. And the next steps obviously obviously would be maybe changing the type of bar setup and uh, changing and molding the position, molding his body into a more sustainable aerodynamic position, and then being able to um, apply this to equipment choices um, and making the equipment faster through a better body position. Uh, so then we can see the repeatability. Uh, we repeat that then in uh, S4, session four, repeat session three again. Um, and there we see we drop down um, very, uh, very smartly. Um, in the CDA, and then we we basically have uh, we accumulate this is like the big data that goes up to the cloud and comes back um, and is uh, validated. Um, this will then obviously be presented. Uh, this is for our data understanding with our riders, but it's uh, there's a different uh, will be a slightly different presentation to the dashboard. But you get basically your live data within seconds, split seconds, um, back to the rider, back to the coach, back to the. Um, the, the, the scientists that's uh, working in the field at that moment. So this is very important um, data to correlate between experiences if you're working with professional riders that have experience in the wind tunnel and being able to apply that in real world aerodynamics. Um, that's, uh, that's very important. Uh, yeah, okay. So testing state is now coasting. Thank testing you very much everybody for turning. having uh, the patience and the sustained attention today. Um, if there are any questions, I'll be uh, very happy to to answer them together with my colleagues as well. I think um, that uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That was uh, that was fantastic. And as I had hinted at um, at the outset, you tied together a lot of loose ends um, that we had throughout the day from the uh, earlier. Uh, 
presenters. I've uh, I've got a couple of questions that just sort of came up for me. You talked about the bike change, um, and and I'm curious. I did a couple of interviews. I was doing daily interviews for a client, uh, a daily talk show for the uh, during the Tour de France, and there was a lot of discussion. Uh, in the run-up to that critical um, final uphill time trial about whether or not they would change bikes. And uh, the conclusion of of some industry experts that I talked to uh, previously was that there would be no bike change, that they would probably ride their TT bikes uh, over the full duration of uh, of that uh, uphill time trial when it was like a hockey stick at the end. It, It was relatively rolling and flat and then steeply uphill at the end. And of the top 10 riders, I think it was on the stage. It was only Tommy Dumoulin that uh, for Jumbo Visma that ended up staying on his TT bike, all the other top riders. And of course the two uh, most famous ones, uh, Tadaj Pogacar who won that and ended up winning the Tour de France and um, Primoz Roglic, they opted to change uh, to the road bike. So I'm just wondering what, what kind of conversations went on, sort of behind the scenes with the riders amongst the teams and were they using something as accurate as per potentially aero lab testing uh, to come up to that conclusion? Cause that change, those were critical to the outcome of that particular race, the biggest bike race of the year. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I mean, and, um, uh, those questions, a lot of those questions will be answered definitely in how Aerolab are going to go forward with our technologies at the teams. And this is why the majority of pro tour teams are very interested to work with us. Um, uh, to all credibility, um, to credit to the uh, Emirates team, uh, it was all about uh, repeatability and being in the comfort zone and understanding when the bike change needed to be made. So it was pretty clear uh, that there were no aerodynamic gains anymore. And they tried to make the the rider as comfortable to climb as fast as he possibly could. So it made sense to change. Um, The only biggest difference was um, between the one rider and the other rider for general GC contention uh, was the one was uh, trained and psychologically uh, believed and when he should change and it was better because they'd been there and they'd trained and they'd done well uh, and they had a good understanding of what everybody's job was at that moment. Um, and the rider was basically put in a comfort zone and he was being able to achieve maximum potential. Um, they would have power meter data for sure. Um, but uh, with aerodynamic drag, maybe there was a calculation made, um, uh, but a simulated calculate calculation, uh, but, but, and, also maybe an energy metabolic rate understanding um, of what your climbing potential is and your speed, your energy um, potential. But I would say at the end of the day um, that it just came back, just came, came down to smooth team working uh, that they gave the rider the um, very much like Phil was saying uh, they had to get the head right uh, with the rider and make the rider believe. And I think that was the difference on the end of the day with the two teams. The, the orchestration um, that I saw of those, of those changeovers, um, if you watch you know, the, the stage unfold and you came down to those final 10 riders, and as I mentioned, Dumoulin was the only one that ended up on his bike, all the other top 10 on the stage, uh, the most significant being uh, Roglic, uh, Pogacar, as well as Wout uh, Van Aert. Um, those changeovers were perfectly uh, orchestrated. It, it was just, it went like that. And all of a sudden they were off the TT bike, bang, on the road bike. So the actual physical changeover and the lost time for that was, I, I think we were thinking was going in this, in this pre-stage discussion, we were thinking, oh, the lost time with the changeover is going to be significant, but mm. that ended up being relatively minor relative to the competition. So it was the actual pure performance that came down uh, as, as the deciding factor on the outcome. And, and I think to give them credit, I think the, the teams were, we had, like you said, they were very drilled, very regimented. Everybody knew what they had to do. Um, I think where the differences will come now is that we will, we will be able to show, be able to show evidence of, uh, of actual drivetrain losses, um, actual tire pressures, choices of pressure with tires and when exactly that they should be changing. So there's no doubt a big difference between a time trial frame geometry and the stiffness in climbing compared to a climb, a road bike and the lightness, obviously the, how light the road bike is. So. Um, it's very easy to, to actually see that uh, those the losses that were made with the transition period from changing from one bike to the other were very, very quickly um, uh, adapted 
and um, and all losses were can uh, cancelled out basically um, in the climb very very quickly. So yeah, awesome. Um, uh, the floor is open uh, for questions. I see a couple coming in. I just had one personal one. You you brought up um, Chris Froome, very asymmetric. What um, what does <laughs> I mean? You see him ride. He rides well. He's not the most beautiful rider. We know we know that. Uh, there's certainly smoother riders out there uh, that we've seen over the course of time. But when you say Chris Room is asymmetric, uh, John, what does what does that mean exactly? Yeah, it's very clear to see that there is a big leg length difference, and mm. how he how he pedals is not as efficient with one leg as the other, and so he has a more dominate dominant uh, leg. And uh, with that dominance, is he sits differently on the saddle. So he doesn't sit what we would say 100% symmetric on the, that saddle. So he uses he uses his uh, more dominant leg um, uh, 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 diff differently in his pedal analysis. So if we did if we had a high speed power meter, um, we would clearly be able to see the difference in his pokes, uh, pedal stroke analysis would be different. And that's what I mean by as being asymmetric. Okay. And, and would that at those sort of monster power outputs that, uh, you know, those riders, you know, are, are riding at for, for extended period of time, could that lead to sort of, you know, muscle imbalance, you know, injury, you know, possibilities, um, or does Froome, you know, know this and, and he do some counterbalancing, uh, muscle activation, strengthening exercises. Yeah, it's very, we're not like a contact sport, like a, like rugby or, uh, or NFL or, or any of those uh, big contact sports. Um, but I think that, um, uh, cycling is, a with overuse injuries and being in a, being for a long time in and not in a correct position. And what I mean is in, like, in a correct position being maybe effective. Um, but what we see is, uh, okay, shortening of hamstrings, but we do see a lot of arterial issues in the, in the pelvic region. So, uh, there, there are a lot of uh, athletes at the end, towards the end of their careers, that have to be operated, and some are operated with success and can further their careers. Uh, but there is a lot of impin impingement issues, and uh, that is, uh, uh, and that is a, a critical um, injury prevention um, target from Talent ID that we try to position, try to get the riders sitting correctly from the very beginning. Um, so, so some, so some riders is very effective not to be 100% and nobody is 100% symmetric. Um, but the way that we try to optimize, and I think that uh, uh, some uh, saddle manufacturers are very keen to be able to understand the 3D technology and be able to support every rider individually of how they, how they sit. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I've, you mentioned the saddles. I was intrigued by that. And I, I've noticed that both Specialized and Physic have uh, come out with these. Um, they almost look like 3D um, molded imprinted, uh, saddles, uh, how, how is that sort of an adaptation at the manufacturing level to some of the, the, the things you were talking about there earlier in your presentation, John? Yeah, I think what is really interesting with how the manufacturers are at the moment in the, in the industry is that, uh, okay, for a manufacturer and Phil also spoke about this is, uh, you know, they're consumer driven. So it's very important, but what we're actually doing at the top of the pyramid is we're having an understanding of the issues, the injuries and the soft tissue injuries that basically uh, is highly repetitive sport. So even though Formula, Formula One is very low to the ground, they have a very high vibration and it's their vibration is very, very similar to the vibration in saddle in uh, cycling um, because of the, the, the stiffness in the bikes and the stiffness in the carbon fiber. There's a lot of vibration that goes through the saddle. It's very similar to Formula One um, um, vibration. Um, and that, uh, that is a really, really good way that uh, 3D printing, 3D technology is going to make the saddle more in individualized, um, a sort of uh, a memory foam type of uh, feel sensation, more dexterity in that area, better blood flow, better blood circulation, um, being able to fix the position, the rider in a correct, more be beneficial position. Being able to, so like uh, like Phil mentioned also positioning fixing the hip in a certain position, um, so yeah there are, I think there are still there's still quite a bit of work to be done in saddles, um, and uh, yeah everybody is individual and, and I like uh, definitely this very good the direction that the manufacturers are going in that way. I found the um, the talk of the team time trial sort of intriguing uh, and how it's sort of it's 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 passed from. Um, 
uh, the Brits to the Australians to now the Danes as the uh, the ruler supreme in 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 the team time trial. I, I do a lot of track commentary, and I I I know some people call it, it's it's about as exciting as watching paint dry. But um, when when you know the nuances of team time trialing and and the details that they go in, like even those gloves, those those full fingered slippery gloves that the Australians were using, um, yeah, all all those details they all sort of add up and. Uh, yeah, the Danes hold the uh, current world record, 344.672, uh, which was set at the uh, uh, the last uh, UCI track uh, world championships. Anything to say, uh, add to that, uh, John? Yeah, I think it's very interesting that they, they also have one of the uh, best engineers that comes out of the motorsport, actually. Um, and they're working with it's a, a British aerodynamics uh, specialist. Um, has also been has also cycled to Dan um, Bingham as uh, you mentioned him before. Yep. Uh, he's working with the Danish team. Um, so, I, I defi- what is what is really interesting with the Danes is that because it comes down to and a, a four kilometer team pursuit is a really intriguing sport because you have four individuals uh, and you have to be able to search for the four. Um, for example, uh, Bradley Wiggins uh, was a very very important. Uh, person in the four, in the team pursuit, but the starter Ed Clancy, and he always held that position for a long, long time, um, and still now is that uh, the experience of setting the pace and taking the team out at the right pacing, uh, and it really comes down to split uh, hundreds of a seconds, um, and they split the track down to one two fives from two fifty meters. They split the track in half. Um, they take out the bankings in their analysis. Uh, yeah, it becomes down. It's very, it is intricate work, and it's uh, it, it is an it is a, an amazing um, uh, team team event, the, the team pursuit, um, and it, there's a it's a very smooth working team that's day in and day out working together. So when it comes down to marginal gains at the end of the day, it comes down to riding a bigger gear, it comes down to actually understanding having a good understanding of being able to sustain and stabilize your sit position. Um, and uh, and the, and the timing of who stays on the front longer and who doesn't drop the pace and uh, yeah that's uh, definitely so that, yeah the way that the Danes are working is uh, is is very very good yeah. Well, there's a lot of science, research, and technology that goes into it, but uh, watching a great team pursuit uh, and team working uh, together is is a thing of beauty uh, when you see them uh, and nailing it. And certainly, those three teams, the top three countries in the world in the team pursuit: uh, Australia, Britain, and uh, now the Danes uh, are certainly symbolic of that. We do have one question coming in uh, from uh, the attendees: uh, uh, Cosmos uh, Devotion uh, John wants to know if uh, the Aerolab system System will work on an iPad. Yeah, most definitely. Is, that's um, that's how we operate. That's how we work uh, with our infield testing. Uh, we work with the iPad. So um, yeah, it's a very smooth running interface that we have. Um, definitely, yeah, it's good. 